Well, it's Tisha B'Av again. In the time of the second base of Mikdash, Tisha B'Av was a yontif. And when the Geula comes, Tisha B'Av will once again be a yontif. And Kinere, this one is not. It's the same Tisha B'Av we've had for almost 2,000 years. Fasting, hungry and thirsty, sitting on the floor, mourning the destruction of the Beis Mikdash, the loss of that special connection with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, and a realization that once again, we have lost the chance to be able to get close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to have a bias where we could live together as an Isha and Isha. The first trick to change is realization. When you go to one of the various support groups for different problems, they always start off by saying, my name is so-and-so and I am an addict. Because if I don't recognize that I have a problem, I'm never going to change it. And so we come to Tisha B'Av and we need to understand why are we still sitting on the ground 2,000 years later saying kinnis, as we've said from ages ago, still trying to find how to solve the problems that we've been in, enmeshed in. And so usually we go through a particular kina. I want to take a little theme of kinas this year, if you will indulge me, and I hope it's the last time we do it. So if I manage to deal with a number of them, maybe that'll make life a little easier for us. Kina Zion starts, Echa asta be'apecha la'abed biyad edomim emunecha. But there's a charata brisbane of Sarum Ashabarata Livchunecha. That's how Kina Zion begins. Kina Tes Echa Tifarti Me Rashosi Hishlichu Ukineged Kise Akovo Tselem Himlichu Bechale Tanoi it continues. Kina Yud. Echa Yoshva Chabatzos Asharon, but Domam Ron, Mipi Nose Aron. Kina Yud Aleph. Echa Eli Kodenume a love. Ben Shimona Shana Chalidrosh may I love. It's of course the kina on Yoshiyahu. Your gimel starts sort of with Echa. Ekoi Oimer Koresla of Bepetza. Your Dalid Echa Esa Sher Kwa Asohu. Tesvav. Echa ashposo pasuach bekeve. You see, a lot of kinnis start with the word echa. Now, obviously, it's a starting off point because the kinnis of Yemiyahu is what we call Megillus Echa. And after the Chorben, Yemiyahu is looking at the destroyed city and the destroyed people and saying, Echa. How could it be? The word of Tishabav is Echa. How could it be? And that is the kinna 
of Tishvav. That is the Eicha of Yimiyahu that we read on the night of Tishvav. Eicha Yashvav Adad. How could it be that sits alone, Ha'ir Rabasi, the city that was filled with people, Ha'yisaka Almana, Rabasi Bagayim, now it's like a widow, that which was great among the nations. So Rasi Babadina's princess among the nations, Ha'yisaka Lamas, is now a tributary. We look at Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim, as Rashi tells us, uh, Zvulun, Shevet Zvulun was on the coast, and they would involve themselves in prakmatia, in commerce. And they would travel throughout the Mediterranean basin, and people would come to them. And when they would come to do business with Zvulun, they said, you know, we came all this way here already. Let's go to Yerushalayim and see the base of Mikdash. And they would be so moved by the experience that they would decide to join the Jewish people. Yerushalayim? Yerushalayim Shomata is attached to Yerushalayim Shomala. It was the greatest of cities. Nikiya Adas Shib Yerushalayim, the Gemara says. People with clean thoughts, pure thoughts. Yerushalayim is called an ear from a word of Oirer. You know, Oruru wakes you up. You go there, you become a different person. That's why there's a mitzvah three times a year to go to Yerushalayim, because just the experience of being in Yerushalayim will change you as a person. And now it's been destroyed. How, how could it be? Shavos of Atamuz, one of the five tragedies, is Apos Thomas burnt to Sefer Torah. Until that point, no one burnt to Sefer Torah. How could it be? After Chris Yamsu, when Amalek attacked us, Eicha, how could it be? We were so great. No one would touch us. How could Yerushalayim be desolate? The city that was filled with people, filled with, with Torah, filled with intellectualism, filled with, with Kedusha, religiosity, with the base of Mikdash, with all of the things that were there. How could it be destroyed? You, you may always walk around saying, how could this have possibly have happened? That is the question of Tishabov. That is what we approach Tishabov and ask. How could this be? It's a terrible, terrible situation when we realize that we don't even ask the question anymore. We accept. It's okay. You know, learn to deal with it. As one thing after another after another is taken away. One uh, uh, destruction after another. We don't even ask the questions anymore. How could it be? <sighs> Martin Gilbert in his book, The Holocaust, tells a story about the Nazis came and decided to kill everybody in the local hospital and the guards kept all the people back. And they went into the maternity ward and started throwing the babies out of the window. And some of the Nazis asked if they could have the privilege of catching them on their bayonets. And one of the people who's writing the story says, we cried until there were no more tears. There were no more words to describe it. The horror. Yemiyo says, Echa. How could it be? Say the Chazal. There were three people who used the Lashon of Echa. Moshe Rabbeinu, Yeshayahu and Yemiyahu. Now the truth is you can find the word Echa in other places as well. The Chazal are obviously telling us 
that there is a connection here. So Yirmiyahu is Eicha. How could it be that Yerushalayim was destroyed? The most powerful city, the most beautiful city, the frumest, the holiest, the, the, the most intellectual city, how could it have been destroyed by these barbarians? And so the answer is the Eicha of Yishayahu, which is what we read uh, as the Haftorah on Parshish Devarim. Parshas Chazon. Chazon Yishio ben Amotz. His uh, vision. And it's how Yishio starts. And Yishayahu also uses the word Echa. Echa Hayesal is Zaina. And you read the Haftorah to the same tune. How could it be? that it became like a harlot and a moral woman. The faithful city. A city that was so faithful, how could it have turned to immorality? It was a city that was filled with the justice and tzedek and now, now they're murderers. They, uh, they, they mix other things into the metals so to as fool people and think they're getting silver when they're getting other things mixed in with it. The wine mixed with water. So Rayach Sorarim Vachavri Ganovim. The princes have turned away, they become a group of thieves. Kulo Oev Shochad, everybody wants a bribe. Virove Shalmonam Yosam Lo Yushpatu Variv Almonal Yovo Alechem. They don't care about the widow and the orphan, and they take advantage even of them. Yeshayahu answers the Eicha of Yimiyahu. Yimiyahu says, how could it be that Jerusalem is destroyed? The greatest of all cities. Eicha? How could it be? And the answer is, because the city that was so faithful, underneath it there was rot. There was immorality. There was injustice. People didn't care about the poor. People were only interested in seeing what they could do to take advantage of other people. They didn't care about anybody else. As long as I can make a few bucks. As long as I've got power. As long as I'm okay. I don't care about all the people I have to step on along the way. So when Yimiyahu looks and says, how could it be that Yerushalayim has become desolate? Yeshayo says, I asked that question. How could it be Yerushalayim became immoral? How did that happen? And the answer to Yeshayo's question is the Echa of Moshe Rabbeinu, which seems strange by comparison. And we also read it with the Echa Trup. How can I handle myself, all your arguments and all your fights? I'm going to set up a court system. That's the Eicha. Sounds like a great idea, they say to Moshe Rabbeinu. And Moshe Rabbeinu sets up a court system. Listen to what Rashi says. You were only interested in your own benefit. Who would you rather learn from? 
Mimcha mitamidecha, from you or from your students. Lo mimcha she nitzta'arta aleha. You went up for 120 days to the mountain. You didn't sleep, you didn't eat, you didn't drink. You heard it from a Kaddish Baruch Hu. You came down with rays of light shining out of your face. Of course I'd rather hear it from Moshe Rabbeinu. Nah, it's too hard. It's too hard. You know, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't come up with this idea on his own. We find out. In, in Devarim, he only mentions himself and Klai Yisrael, but the fact of the matter is um, that Yisro is the one who mentioned it originally. He says, this is too hard for you to have the people standing all day and waiting. Well, if this was such an obvious problem, why didn't Moshe Rabbeinu figure out himself? And there's a very simple answer, because it wasn't. Rashi says, yeah, min boy got a erv. And Rashi says, that's not possible to say, explains this to because this was the day after Yom Kippur. And that's the beginning of Yakel. So he had to come down and teach them all about the Mishkan and tell them what to bring and start collecting everything. He didn't have time to judge the people all day. So Rashi says, what it means is, it, Dayan Shadon Din Emes Afilo Shah Achas. It's as if he did it the whole day. Shah Achas doesn't even have to mean an hour, it can mean less than an hour. Right? When Malazabar Dadai cries himself to death, Basko says, Rebbe says, Yesh Misha Kanda Olam Haba Bashah Achas. He didn't cry for an hour. That means that Moshe Rabbeinu judged him for a very short period of time. And Yisro said, hey, Moshe, this isn't working. And Moshe's like, why? What's the problem? He says, the people don't want to wait. He says, it's not a very long wait. They still don't want to wait. It's not worth it to them. It's too much effort. So here, in the Eicha of Moshe Rabbeinu, he says, and when Yisro said this to me, I said to the Jewish people, would you want me to set up a whole bunch of court and judges, or would you rather come and hear it from me? And they're like, nah, too hard to listen to you. Would you have a chance to go and see Moshe Rabbeinu? There were there were people who would travel great distances just for the schus to be able to look at a god of Israel, to see him, to meet him, even not to talk to him, just to see him. It was a story that we were coming back from a conference and uh, rabbinical conference, and at every stop, so the gedolim would get out you know, on the platform and wave to the people. and All the people would cheer and, you know, it was... Chavaz Chaim didn't come out. So finally, with Mayor Shapiro, he says, uh, Lublin. He says, how come the Rav isn't coming out? The people want to see you? He says, what for? They want to see an old Jew? There are plenty of old Jews. He says, they don't want to see an old Jew. They want to see a God of Israel. He says, yeah, I'm not a God of Israel. He says, well, they think you are. He says, they're wrong. He says, so what would be so bad if you came out and waved and pretended you were a God of Israel and you're really not? He says, a checker. He says, and so what of a checker? He says, I'll go to Gehenna. Rabbi Shapiro in Chassidish, he says, and it's not Kedai to go to Gehenna to make thousands of Yidin happy? <laughs> he says the next stop, Chavetz Chaim was the first one off the train. <laughs> to have a schus to be able to look at the Gedoli Torah. 
Uh, unbelievable opportunity. And here you have a chance to go and ask your question directly to Moshe Rabbeinu? There's a story with Moshe Feinstein where someone calls 11 o'clock at night and Rav David answers the phone. He says, yeah. He says, I have a Shiloh. I have to ask the Rav. He says, what's the Shiloh? Is Wrigley's gum kosher? He says, 11 o'clock at night? You're calling and, and bothering the Rav with this? He says, I don't trust anybody else. You have a chance to go and ask your question to Moshe Rabbeinu and said, by the way, what did Hashem tell you exactly? Now nah, it's too hard. Or Sameach has a uh, publication called The Ornet. And uh, The Ornet has a question and like a Ask the Rabbi section. Anonymous. And one of the people who worked there, this story is 20 years old, so I don't know about today, but he said, a lot of the questions that we get are from, from people who are basically asking Shilas. They don't know who's answering the question. They have no idea who the rabbi is. It's a group of rabbis, not one person. In the ask the rabbi section of the Ornet. And I said, why don't you ask your Rav? He says, uh, I, I don't have access to a Rav. He said, where do you live? Brooklyn. He says, and there are no rabbis? None that are accessible. I have to wait too long. I'd much rather type a question in to an anonymous rabbi and get an answer than to have to wait online to talk to a Pesach or a Rav or to go to their house and actually ask them a question. It's too much effort. Moshe Rabbeinu feels bad, but Hashem says, don't feel bad. In Pashas Ves Chonan, after Hashem speaks, Perak hey Pasar Khavala Vatomru Hain Her Onu Hashem Lokenu Es Kvodovi as Godlovi as Kolo Shamanu Mitoka Esha Yomaze. Yeah, we we heard God speak Viata Lama Namus Kisokanu Aisha Gadoila Azois. Every time he speaks, we die. This is too hard. Yosva Nakhmashmo is called Hashem Lokenu Old Vamosna will die. Here's the punchline. Pasuk Chav Dalad. Krov ata, you go. V'shama es ko asha yoma Hashem elokeinu. Find out what Hashem wants to tell us. V'at t'daber elenu. Es ko asha yidaba Hashem elokeinu elecha. V'shama no v'asinu. You, feminine, you girl, go girl, go and tell us. Says Rashi. I said, At, because Hitashtim is Kolichik in the Keva, I became weak like a woman. What does that mean? It's not talking about physical strength. It's talking about uh, the role of men ought to be Mashbia and role of women ought to be Makabal. He says, I stopped becoming mashpi and I just became a makabal for you. Why? Shinitzarati aleichem, because I was pained for a PC as yodi, I became weak. Kiraisi, because I saw she'encham charedim lehiskare ve'lov me'ahava. You weren't trembling to come close to Hashem out of love. V'kilohaya yofa lachem lomod mi pia gvura v'lolunot neid mi menu. Wouldn't you rather hear it from God? So they come to Har Sinai, and Hashem speaks the first two Dibros. And after each one, the people die because the experience is so overwhelming. And they said, okay, that's enough. Moshe, find out what Hashem wants and tell us. Don't you want to hear? You have the opportunity of hearing from a Kosh Baruch himself. No, that's okay. It's too hard. I don't want to die eight more times. Forget about it. You find out and you tell us. So when Moshe says, don't you want to hear it from me? And they say, no, that's too hard. Hashem says, don't feel bad. They don't want to hear it from me either. 
They don't want to listen to me. They don't want to listen to you. You know why? Because it's too hard. So I don't want to be bothered. Says Moshe Rabbeinu. Echa. How could it be? How could it be that Klai Yisrael, after all the Nisim and the flows, after coming to Har Sinai and having a Kodesh Baruch Hu speak to them, how could it be that they then turn around and say, nah, I don't want to hear from Hashem. And then they turn around to Moshe and say, nah, we don't want to hear from you either. People care so little? You know what happens when people don't care? It'll take a while, but the rot will set in. And then it's too hard for me to go out and work hard. So I'll water down the wine. And I'll, and I'll uh, pay off a judge to get what I want. And if I have to step on a widow on an orphan along the way, it's worth it to me. Because it's too hard for me to do it on my own. Torah says you're supposed to lend money without interest. And if the person doesn't pay you back by Shemitah, well, the whole loan is canceled. A person steals money and he doesn't have a way to pay it back. So we sell him as an Evid Ivory. Do you want to buy an Evid Ivory? Well, is he like a regular slave? No. You can't give him any demeaning work to do. If you have only one pillow, you give it to him. If you're having steak for dinner, you can't give him chicken. He eats steak too. Oh, and by the way, you have to support his wife and children along the way. Who in their right mind would buy this guy? Why should I want to live a system like this? Why get taken advantage of? Somebody uh, invested money with somebody. And from his point of view, it was a hard money loan. Meaning he gave him money and he was supposed to get 10% back on his money. And uh, the person, the deal they were on went bad. And he said, I'll pay you back the principal, but I'm not going to pay you any return. This person was furious and he came to me. If I could somehow influence this guy to pay him back the interest that was due on the loan. I said, well, it's not interest on a loan. It's investment money. But you're not allowed to ask interest on a loan. Didn't you sign a Heter Iska? He says, yeah, but everyone knows that doesn't mean anything. Everyone knows that's a joke. I want my interest. I thought to myself, the Gemara says people lend with interest, don't come back and tchias and mesim. And you are fighting to get that interest. You signed a head to iska so that you wouldn't be over this terrible, terrible Avera. And you're upset because the guy is taking the head to iska seriously. Won't pay you your interest? It's a firm person, not a non-firm person, firm person. And, and, you, and you, you look and you say, why would a person do that? I learned the term. I learned the term. Somebody taught me this. They say, oh, uh, where's Chaim? He's sitting. The person said, the first time I heard this, I was like, sitting where? And they're like, get a little embarrassed. Like, you know, sitting. He says, it took me a while to figure out they meant like in Otisville, he's sitting in prison because he he did some shtick. My Shapiro once said, what the Torah calls Isuri the Arisa, yeshiva guys call shtick. Eh, shtick, some kind of financial shenanigans that landed them in prison. Okay. Not even an embarrassment anymore. Because, uh, you know, got to make a living. 
And you say to yourself, how could it be that from Jews are acting in ways that are illegal? I have to tell you, having worked in Kiryu for many years, we very often have a situation where, uh, you know, I'm doing question and answers. And people say, how do you explain, you know, Jews uh, who do bad things? So I have a standard answer. The answer is, I said, what? What are you talking about? Do you ever hear anybody who's afraid to go into a Jewish neighborhood? It's the, some of the lowest crime rates of any group, you know, in, in any society. This worked until one time I had someone there from the district attorney's office. And he said, you're right, Rabbi, when it comes to violent crimes. When it comes to financial crimes, what they call white-collar crimes, the from community has a higher percentage of crime than other communities. What a chil Hashem. I, 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 was, I was dumbstruck. I didn't know what to say. How do I justify from people? stealing and lying and, and acting in all kinds of immoral ways. The Eicha of Yeshayahu, how does it happen that everyone became corrupt? I told this story, I'm sure, in the past. Uh, I was in uh, the Catskills for a summer, and I went to this farm store in uh, Woodburn, Moshe Rosenbaum, Moro was running it. And, uh, and I told him the following story. I said, uh, I'm in Shul, wherever I was staying. And the Shabbos Mincha, and I was learning. And there were three people gathered around the bima. And they're talking. And one says, you know, I leased a car. And it ends up, it was 200 miles over the lease agreement. They charge a, a dollar a mile. Well, I wasn't going to pay the $200, says this from person, at the Bima in front of the Aron Kodesh in Shul on Shabbos Mincha. So I wasn't going to pay the $200. So I found this Israeli guy who has someone who can turn back the odometer. So he hooks it up and he's turning it back and it, gra- and it breaks. Oh, what do we do now? He says, don't worry, I work with somebody. Yeah, and uh, he'll steal a similar odometer from another car. And he steals it, and I install it, and we turn it back to the right mileage. He only charged me 50 bucks. I saved $150. And the other two guys are going, oh, shkoyach. And I'm watching this scene in shul on Shabbos Mincha, in front of the Yom Kodesh, and he's speaking with pride, how he ripped off the lease company, stole somebody's odometer to save $150? So I'm telling this story over tomorrow, and I said, there was a time when Jews used to die for what we believe in. And now you can buy a Jew for $150. And he says to me, $150? I can buy a Jew for less than that. So what do you mean? He says, I'm a Svarim store. People come in to buy Svarim. And then I add on the tax. And they say, I don't want to pay the tax. I said, okay, who's your Paisic? Because your motion financing says you have to pay the sales tax. And the Satma Rebbe says you have to pay the sales tax. So Faket, who's your, who's your Paisik? And they start to get angry at me. And I said, oh, I didn't realize you don't believe in the Abishta. They're like, what? I'm buying Svarim. What do you mean I don't believe in the Abishta? You think that if you have to pay this 8% sales tax, you won't be able to feed your family. You won't be able to clothe them. You won't be able to pay your tuitions. That's going to break you. So you have to break halacha and lie and cheat and steal to save yourself the 8% sales tax on this, on this halacha safer that you're buying. How could it be? How did we become corrupt? It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing as a from Jew when you see people act in these kind of ways. 
That was the Eicha of Yishayahu. How could it be? And the answer is the Eicha of Moshe Rabbeinu. How could it be that people don't want to hear from me? The answer is because it's too hard. And we can't be bothered. Can't be bothered. My parents, you never heard them say, I don't feel like going to work. You never heard them say, I can't make Shabbos. I can't make Pesach. You do what you have to do. That was always the attitude. You do what you have to do. My father dropped out of school after ninth grade to go to work to help support his family. He was starving. Not like a kid who comes home from school after he had uh, breakfast and lunch and snack and he comes home and says, Mom, I'm starving. I mean, there's no food starving. He dropped out of school to work just to be able to have money to buy food, milk for his, his siblings. And nobody helped him. He built himself up and started his own business and built things up. And he had no understanding of people who weren't willing to do what they had to do. One of my brothers told me he was once unloading a truck of 50 pound bags of soil. And my father comes by and says, do you need a hand? He says, yeah. He says, look at the end of your arm. That's how my father talked because that's how he lived his life. No one helped him. Had to do everything on his own. You do what you have to do. Who cares if it's hard? Many years ago, I was staying with a doctor in Florida. And uh, he's davening with 7.30. He gets to Shul, 7.20. I said, oh, it's nice to come early. He says, I don't understand from people who don't. He says, don't you have to put on your tefillin and say brachas and, 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 and prepare yourself? You run in in the middle of Pesuket Zimri, you throw on your tefillin, you mumble your tefillin. What is that? When they come on time, the answer is it's too hard. Davening is too long. I don't want to go to a shir. Don't you have a Zoom hookup? What do I have to go for? It's too hard. Nobody wants to do anything if it's too hard. Right, Fendel, the founder of the Hebrew Academy of Nassau County, who uh, my entire family today is from because of him. When I say my family, I don't mean my immediate family. I mean my parents, their children, and their grandchildren, and their over 100 great-grandchildren are all from because of Ray Fendel. So he said he used to go to a shir by Rav Hutna. And they were in a small room, and it was hot, and it was crowded. And uh, Rav Hutna spoke quietly. So he said to one of the organizers, he says, why don't we move into the auditorium? Let him take a microphone. We can sit like mention. And he said, because Rav Hutna holds Bashita, that you have to work hard to get Torah. Right? that you have to be willing, as the Gemara says, to kill yourself over Torah. You have to work hard. People don't want to work hard. Walk into a share, and the Bachram are like, ah, go ahead, Rebbe. Let's see if there's anything you can say that's going to interest me. Nobody wants to work hard. 35 years ago, we had some second-year seminary girls at our table. And uh, I don't know, we're talking about different courses. And they said, well, there's this one course, you know, but we don't like the teacher. He's boring. And my wife, of course, who's an intellectual, she was like, what do you mean he's boring? Don't you have an obligation to learn? And they were like, no, not if they're boring. I don't have to listen. If it's too hard, if I have to concentrate, if I have to schlep, 
If I have to work too hard, I don't want to do it. As Moshe Rabbeinu, don't you want to hear from me? No, it's too hard. And says Moshe Rabbeinu, Yeshayahu's Eicha is because of that. You know why Yerushalayim became immoral? You know why everything fell apart? Because we lost the ability to work hard and care, to become better people, to improve ourselves, to act morally. We look for shortcuts and ways around it and 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 shtiklach and patentim and whatever we can come up with to avoid having to do what has to be done. Somebody said, a lot of the problems that we talk about in society have always existed. It's just more well-known. There's one new phenomena. Young couples who get divorced in the first few years of marriage. And I've spoken to some of them, and they say the same thing almost all the time. I don't need this. I don't have to put up with this. My parents never said that. Of course you have to put up with it. You're married. You understand? You put up with it. You work hard. You make it happen. Don't just complain. But if it's too hard, why should I do it? I don't need this. What for? I want it easy. I don't want any, I don't want any mice in their fish. As Rabbi Left said one year on Tisha B'Av, says, you find boys who are willing to be mice in their fish to learn Torah. If you buy them an apartment, then you buy them a car and you support them. And you know, take it. He says, what's the mysterious nefesh? They're willing to get up every morning and go to Kolel? I said this over a few times, and guys said, well, not every morning, but certainly many mornings. You know, is that a serious nefesh? He says, I had friends who learned by candlelight because they couldn't afford the electricity. I had friends who only ate pasta every night because they couldn't afford anything else. And I'm not talking about in Yerushalayim. I'm talking about in Cleveland, Ohio, when I was in Tells. And nobody complained because it was a, a schus. Schus to be able to, 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 to learn. An opportunity. Now if it's hard, I don't want to. Too hard for me. Can't be bothered. You walk into a yeshiva. For davening. Sometimes they use a shul. Dirty coffee cups on the tables. No one put back svarim. You go into the kitchen. A cereal spilled. Milk spilled. Nobody buys cleaning it up. The milk is still out all night. No one bothered putting it in the refrigerator. Meh, it's too much. I can't be bothered. Serious nefesh? Eh. Not for me. Says the Yemiyo, why are we sitting on the ground? How do we have a korban? Why don't we have Yushalayim? Why don't we have the base of Mikdash? Eicha, how could it be? Yishayo says, you know why? It's the Jewish people are no longer the Jewish people. How could it be the Jewish people have become corrupt and dishonest and don't care and take advantage of people? How could it be? And Moshe Rabbeinu says, because they don't care. It's too hard. In my parents' generation, you never heard anybody say, I just want to chill. Nobody chilled. Rabbi Chait said when he was learning by Rabbi David Leibowitz, he once said to the boys, you guys don't even know how to battle. Even when you're wasting time, you don't know how to do it. You just, you just literally kill time. Like you have so much of it that you can kill it. And time comes in handy later on in life. So, if we want to see, answer the Eich of Yemiyahu, how could it be Yerushalayim is this way? Then we have to answer the Eich of Yishayahu and say, because we have lost what it means to be the Jewish people, that we were a people apart, that our word meant something, that we were honest and decent people. And if you want to know how to get that back, it's the Eicha of Moshe Rabbeinu. 
How could it be that people aren't willing to try, to sacrifice, to inconvenience themselves, to put themselves out of the way? Sometimes I pick somebody up. I live at the top of Harnov. And I, and I say, where are you going? And they're like, you know, well, I live down on the bottom. You could just leave me anywhere. <laughs> it's like a cold, rainy night, you know. And so I drive, you know, through the neighborhood to, to their house. And like, oh, you don't have to do this. You know, oh, it's such a tzaddik. I said, put this in my art scroll biography. It was a cold, rainy night. And Rabbi Olavsky was sitting in a warm, comfortable car. And instead of just dropping me in the middle of no place so that I could walk in the freezing rain, he went five minutes out of his way to bring me hope. Wow, there's an art school biography if I've ever heard one. You know? And I said, you better write it down because there's not that much stuff you're going to put into mine. So if you got something, put it in there. But that's already, that's already, uh, that's like a great thing what any decent person would do. They'll just drop you off. Have to care. <sighs> the Gemara in Sukkah says that first Mashiach ben Yosef is going to come before Mashiach ben David and he's going to be the last casualty in the war and then Mashiach ben David will come. So Rav Desl explains that Yosef was the heart and Yehuda was the Rosh. And Mashiach is going to come not with the intellectual head, but with the emotional heart. We're going to start to care about each other again and look out for each other. And when we start looking out for each other, then we can get the Geula and we can move to the Rosh. But first, we have to care. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu said. Show that you care, and you won't have the Eicha of Yishayahu and Yemiyahu. Mirza Hashem. This will be the last year that I have to do a Tisha B'Av podcast sitting on the floor. Next one, we'll have a live broadcast from the base of Mikdash. And I'll just, I'll just, simulcast whatever Mashiach has to say and share it with my regular audience because we're this close to be able to turn things around. All we have to do is show that we're willing to put in the effort. Mirz Hashem. We should all be Zaycha to an Emesa, Nechama, and Gula.